Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good day. You've reached Waikato Swift Removals. How can we be of service? Hello. I don't know where to start. My situation is just so frustrating. I see. If I were to guess, I'd say you're relocating. And it seems like an impossible task for you. Spot on. I'm moving from New Zealand to Canada this month. And there's so much stuff that I absolutely need to bring along with me. You've called the right place. We specialise in such things, but we'll need to know a few details to be able to help you. Let's start with your full name and your phone number. It's Ruby Thompson, and you can reach me at 02637 99785. If I'm not available, you can leave me a voicemail and I'll call you back as soon as possible. Very well. We'll also need to know the pickup location. Will it be in the Waikato region? Yes, I'll have my things prepared for pickup at 119 Avalon Drive. That's A V A L O N Drive in Hamilton, Waikato, New Zealand. Splendid. And what would be the delivery address in Canada? During the first few months, I'll be staying at 2096 Jasper Avenue. That's J A S P E R Avenue in Edmonton, Alberta. Canada. Alberta? A friend of mine lives there. I've heard that the weather there is somewhat more extreme. In any case, when would you like us to schedule the pickup? Next Wednesday would be ideal. That'll be January the 9th. Yes, that's perfectly possible. Would you also like us to clean after the pickup? We gladly offer it to all our customers for a minor fee. Many people find it very time saving. Sure. I think it'll be especially called for in my case. I'm ending my tenancy on Saturday, January the 12th, and the house will have to be neat and tidy by then. This means that we'll schedule all the cleaning for Friday the 11th. This will give the house at least 12 hours to stop smelling like detergents. Thank you. That's very thoughtful of you. How much will I have to pay in total? You can estimate this by visiting our website and using our online cost calculator. Let's see. Oh, wow. Your company's services seem rather pricey. Indeed. Many removal companies offer lower prices, but they do so at the cost of quality. We prefer to stay honest with our customers. International moving is a costly endeavour, and we believe that the removal companies that tell you otherwise lack in integrity. You have a point. There's something else I need to clarify with you. Will it be possible to store my things for two months before shipping them to my address in Canada? I'll have a lot on my plate soon after moving there, and I'd rather unpack everything when I settle down. Certainly. We'll simply keep your things in our storage until you confirm that you want us to ship them. Our customers do it all the time. Perfect. What a relief. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do you have any preferences when it comes to packing? We believe that it's important to consider the requests from our customers throughout the pickup. This ensures that everything gets packed in the way that you prefer. For instance, you may want to pack certain items together to make it easier to unpack them later. I can't think of anything like that at the moment. Most people seem to be fussy about dishes and clothes. Is that your case as well? That's right, my wardrobe. I'd appreciate it if you could pack my clothes in a way that is easily accessible. Understood. We'll be sure to pack all your clothes in what our company refers to as at-hand package. Will there be any other requests? 
Yes, my coffee maker is worth special mentioning. It was one of the few belongings that my great-grandparents took with them when they moved to New Zealand. As you can tell, it holds special importance for my family. Fascinating. Because this coffee maker is so valuable to you, we'll store it along with other high-value items that you have. Speaking of which, I have a collection of family photos that will need careful handling. All these photos have been backed up, so there's no need to place them along with valuable items. But I would prefer them to be packed together with my personal things. I understand completely. We'll put all your family photos in your personal container. Will you be specifying any other preferences? Yes, one more thing. I've an expensive computer that I sadly can't take with me. It's brand new and it has cost me a pretty penny. I'd love for it to go into high-value items as well, although I'm afraid it's too bulky for this category. No worries. This section with all your other high-value items will certainly fit your computer in. We'll also label it as a fragile item. Thank you. That'll be it. Will you be able to provide me with a list that mentions where everything is packed? Of course. We make such lists for all our customers. They make unpacking a lot less stressful. Indeed. You're very thorough. We try our best. It seems that we have covered all the bases and everything is ready for us to begin moving your things as we have discussed. I'm so relieved now. I'll just take my luggage and be on my way to Canada. You can rest assured that your things will be safe with us. We wish you a safe journey. I certainly count on that. And thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2 First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello and welcome to show. In this episode, I will talk about the types of guitars and the recent trend in the guitar market. Now, the range of guitars available is huge. There are acoustic guitars, electric guitars, 12-string guitars, steel guitars and bass guitars plus many others that we don't have time to discuss today. First, let's look at electric guitars, that is, guitars that are plugged into amplifiers. These guitars are slim and worn close to the neck, so less force is needed to press down on the strings. They can be very noisy, so they are best used for public performances such as concerts and shows. Make sure to keep your practice space in mind as well. You may cause quite a disturbance with an electric guitar if you're practicing in common areas or in an apartment, for example. If that's the case, you may have to avoid these types of guitars. Next, we have steel guitars. These guitars originated in Hawaii and are unusual because they are worn horizontally across the player's lap. 
These are quite specialist instruments and are usually played by more experienced musicians. If you were just starting out as a budding musician, this probably will not be the best guitar for you. However, it would be a great goal to work towards if you are devoted to playing guitar and are hoping to get better with time. Next, we have 12 string guitars, and as the name suggests, they have 12 strings made up of 6 regular strings and 6 thinner ones. One good thing about 12 string guitars is that they produce rich, beautiful sounds that you will never get from a 6 string guitar. Many folk and blues musicians looking for a bit of authenticity like to play 12 string guitars. Another thing about 12 string guitars is that they are also usually used as complementary rhythm instruments, as they back up the lead guitar pretty well. Finally, we come to the acoustic guitar. These are always a popular choice with beginners, because the prices of basic acoustic guitars are quite low. You can buy a brand new guitar of this type without breaking the bank. They are suitable for ensemble playing, that is, playing in groups. They are often sought after by songwriters, because they go well with singing voices. If you plan on playing solo, starting off with an acoustic guitar will make it easier to learn the fundamental principles of guitar playing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, guitar sales are experiencing a sway from retail sales to online sales. Online guitar retailers are growing by leaps and bounds. Over 50% of guitars sold through a variety of sources are being bought on the web. Physical retail stores, on the other hand, are experiencing a decline in sales. A report from research firm Ibis World shows consecutive growth of total markets in the last five years. Even if today's music fans are more likely to worship pop stars and rappers over their parents' guitar heroes, there's little to indicate that the guitar's reign is over. And there might actually be more to show the opposite. It's true that six-string guitars have stumbled a bit in popularity, but electric sales rose more than 10% between January 2018 and January 2020. Sales of acoustic guitars have soared in the last five years, thanks to the abiding popularity of the instrument in country music. Now, in terms of consumer groups, half the guitars every year are bought by first-time players. 90% of whom abandon the instrument in the first year. The 10% who stick with it, on the other hand, are willing to shell out as much as $10,000 on guitars and other accessories over the course of their life. This makes education a new area ripe for potential, as it will get people to buy guitars and actually stay with them. Another trend is that 50% of new guitarists today are women. More companies have been seeking out relationships with female artists and have highlighted women in marketing campaigns. OK, so that's about all the time I have for today. So thank you very much for listening. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3.
Section 3 First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi Martin, have you finished your biology paper yet? Yep, I've just finished it actually. Good for you, I haven't started it yet. I'm still looking for a suitable topic. What subject did you choose? Well, I searched for a topic for ages but finally decided on the history of strawberry growing in the UK. Seriously? Strawberry growing? Yes, strawberry growing. Sounds fascinating. Actually, it's not as dull as you might be thinking. I'm also studying economics, and it links in with lots of the topics. I'm for that too. I bet there are lots of things you don't know about strawberries. Hmm, maybe. Go on then. Like what? Like the fact that strawberries weren't domesticated until the 14th century. Before that, they grew wild. Oh really? I didn't know that. Yep. Plus, they contain many nutrients and are considered to be great for the body. You're not going to tell me the entire history of strawberries, are you? Well, if you don't mind listening, it would be good practice for my presentation tomorrow. I'll listen to yours too when you finish it, if you like. Go on then, let's do it. So tell me, where were these strawberries domesticated? According to my research, the garden strawberry, which was the first type of domestic strawberry, was actually cultivated in Brittany, in France. But long before that... The Roman poets Virgil and Ovid mentioned strawberries way back in the 1st century AD, but they used them as ornaments and as medicine to treat depression, not as food. I see. Well, people must have been delighted when they became thought of as food. They would have been a great addition to the diet. Well, apparently King Charles V decided to grow them in his royal garden, and by the 16th century the cultivation of strawberries was quite common throughout Europe and America. So, he was the one who was responsible for popularising the strawberry? I suppose so, yes. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. But isn't the UK too cold for growing strawberries? Well, it's true that the temperatures here can get quite low, so strawberries usually have to be grown under glass, otherwise they wouldn't survive the frosts. Are they hard to grow? Hmm, yes and no, I suppose. If you wanted to grow them for yourself in your own back garden, it wouldn't be hard. But to grow them commercially and make profit from them, you have to do a lot of planning. You see, strawberry plants start to decline in productivity and fruit quality after only two years and have to be replaced, which can be expensive to the grower. Right, so how many strawberries will grow per plant under good conditions? It depends. On average, maybe 150 grams of strawberries per plant. It could be more if the conditions are perfect even up to 400 grams. So what are the perfect conditions? Well, strawberries like to grow in sandy soil, and they need plenty of sunlight. Ah, I see. So that's why I always find grains of sand on the strawberries I buy in the supermarket. Yes, that would explain it. Hmm, that's interesting. If you plant them in sandy soil and give them plenty of water at the start of spring, they should be quite big by the end of summer. If there's a particularly cold winter then fruit farmers have to cover the plants with plastic sheets to protect them from the frost. If you ever visit a fruit farm in the UK, in the winter you'll see greenhouses full of strawberry plants covered in plastic. Interesting. But what I always wonder about is how they stop the strawberries from going bad before they reach the supermarkets. 
Well, the strawberries are usually picked while they are still green, before they are ripe and ready to eat. Once you have picked a strawberry, it stops growing, but it continues to ripen, so by the time it reaches the supermarket shelves, it is usually turned red. Ah, oh, I see. And does the UK export lots of strawberries overseas? To Europe or Asia, for example? Actually, no. We import most of our strawberries from Spain and Egypt. And more recently, from China. Most of the strawberries grown in the UK are also sold and eaten here in the UK. Well, thank you for all that information, Martin. I'm sure your presentation will go well. You seem to have done lots of research on strawberries. I really hope so. I need the marks to bring my grades up. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the Beamish Farming Village Museum. First of all, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the history of the museum before you go off and have a look around on your own. So, if you look over here to your left, you can see the river that runs right through the middle of the village. It was because of this natural source of fresh water that this site was an obvious location for a farm. The woods just beyond the river are another reason as they provided both fuel and shelter. In these ways, the site was very suitable for the purposes of agriculture from an early time, and in fact, there is historical evidence that a farm in some form or another has been located here since the early 16th century, and the landowner at that time was a Mr. John Snow. Local archives contain data on land use from this time, Local archives contain data on land use from this time, and it is noted that livestock was kept in the fields over here between the river and the woods. Over 200 animals, including pigs and chickens, were kept here at the time the data was recorded in 1721. Now, I'm going to give you a plan of the site, and I'd just like to point out where everything is and then you can just wander around for yourselves for the rest of the visit. I've already pointed out the river, which is on the left, and you should be able to see that on your plan. It's the curved line. Now we're standing at the entrance where the arrow is at the bottom of your plan, and immediately to our right is the ticket office. You won't need to go there, because you've got yours, but just past it are the toilets. Always useful to know where they are. To the left of us by the entry gate is the gift shop, that's where you can buy guidebooks and souvenirs. Now if you look straight ahead, you'll see that all the buildings are arranged in a semicircle. The big rectangular building right opposite at the far end of the site is the workshop. That's where the farm machinery was repaired. The building to the right of the workshop is the store. It's the big building, slightly at an angle. Now, if you look again at the gift shop on our left, the building next to that, the long building, is the engine room and the one after that, the building with six sides, is the cafe. 
Obviously, that's a new building, but you'll be pleased to know that they do serve very nice old-fashioned teas and scones. So I think that's everything. As I said, you're free to wander around yourselves, but if anyone would like to join me for a guided tour, I'll be starting from the engine room in ten minutes. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.